thank you for joining us today on this webinar where we'll be talking about next generation strategies for managing edge of field nutrient losses. I am Dr. Laura Christensen from the University of Illinois. We'll continue our discussion with these next few slides. For us here in the Midwest, artificial subsurface drainage, aka tile drainage, is an essential part of how we do agriculture. We have a long history of doing tile drainage because it improves crop growth, improves crop yield, helps us get into our fields earlier in the spring than we otherwise would be able to, and really in doing all of these things reduces risk. And really we know that tile drainage is one of the most uh, consistent infrastructure improvements that a farmer can do to provide a positive return on investment. So there's lots of great reasons, productivity reasons, why we do tile drainage. But in recent years, we've also learned that tile drainage changes the natural hydrology. That is, it changes how water would naturally leave a field. That's kind of the point. Uh, but tile drainage also serves as a pathway or a conduit for nutrients, primarily nitrogen, to move from our fields where we want those nutrients to be to downstream waters where we don't want those nutrients to be. Fortunately, colleagues, extension colleagues across the Midwest have come together to develop a new uh, booklet that describes the 10 ways to reduce nitrogen loads from drain cropland across the Midwest. There's not 100 practices to do this. There's not two practices to do this. There's really just about 10. And so in our new booklet, where you can access um, through the link at the bottom of the screen, that link is also uh, being advertised as a part of the publicity for this webinar, so you should have access to that link. The booklet describes all 10 ways. So if you're interested in what I'm saying, what I say over the next 10 minutes, you have access to this information via this booklet that's already available freely to you online. So for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll just go through basically these 10 practices that we describe in the booklet, and then the last five minutes, We'll, we'll zoom in on one of my favorite practices of the 10 ways called wood chip bioreactors. So starting at the left of the screen, if you are interested in practices that are in the field and are cropping strategies, <clears throat> that's where we'll start. Starting with improved nitrogen management, which is something that Matt also talked about. For in, improving tile drainage water quality, the nitrogen management practices we recommend uh, revolve around reducing nitrogen fertilizer rate to the university recommended application rate or and or uh, shifting nitrogen fertilizer timing to be more in sync with when the crop needs that nitrogen fertilizer for example away from the fall and towards spring applications now fine-tuning nitrogen management is very difficult it's going to be uh, it's extremely challenging to get nitrogen management exactly right every year due to complexities of the crop has different nutrient needs during the season, each field is different, every year is different, uh, but nevertheless, improving nitrogen management, improving management of our nitrogen fertilizer is a low-hanging fruit, a practice that we always recommend on every acre that gets nitrogen fertilizer. The next infield management uh, strategy to improve tile drainage water quality is winter cover crops. A winter cover crop is typically planted around harvest time and grows and protects the soil over the winter. Sometimes cover crops can overwinter and so they come back in the spring. But the idea here is that we wanna extend the period of the year where we have a crop actively growing, actively taking up water, actively taking up nitrogen and holding on to that nitrogen. And in doing so, we send less nitrogen downstream through the tiles. The last infield cropping strategy that we promote is about using a perennial within the cropping system. An example of this would be something like two years of corn followed by three years of alfalfa. Alfalfa is a perennial in that it grows for two or more years without having to be replanted. The idea for water quality with the perennial is the same as with the cover crop. You're simply extending the period of the year where you have a crop growing, taking up water, taking up nitrogen, and holding on to that nitrogen. 
Now moving into the next set of practices, these are also infield practices, but these have more to do specifically with the drainage system. So these are practices like drainage water management, which is often known as the practice of controlled drainage. This is the practice of implementing adjustable control structures throughout the drainage system to adjust the level of the tile outlet, which you can see there in the small figure. The tile drainage water has to flow over the level of those gates before it can leave the drainage system and actually move downstream. And so by holding water back and adjusting the outlet level during certain times of the year, where, we're, where we don't really need to be draining our fields, by holding that water back, we also hold nitrogen in the water back in the field. And so this is how this practice improves water quality. The next practice in this subset is the practice of reducing drainage intensity. And this is done typically in two ways. One, either installing drain tiles wider apart in the soil, or two, as shown here, installing drain tiles at a shallower depth that is closer to the surface of the soil. Much like drainage water management, the idea here is that we're simply sending less water downstream. The drainage systems are still designed to meet our crop productivity goals, but we're simply sending less water downstream overall and thus less nitrate downstream. Now the third practice in this subset, recycling drainage water, AKA drainage water recycling was also one that Matt mentioned. And I think this is one of the practices that I'm most excited about for the future. This is the practice of storing drainage water on site in a pond or reservoir when you have drainage water occurring in those spring and early summer months. And then later in that, in that growing season, when the crop might need supplemental irrigation, you can use that water that you've stored to irrigate the crop. So from a water quality perspective, you have the potential to send zero nitrogen downstream if you can store it all on site. And then from the crop production perspective, if you're in a place where, or in a year where you need that supplemental irrigation, there's a potential for a big crop yield benefit by doing this practice. Now it tends to be expensive, but when we think 50 or 100 years in the future and potentially more variable climate, this is one of the practices that gets me really excited. The last subset of practices are really the edge of field or offsite practices. Matt mentioned bioreactors, and we're going to come back to that at the, at the end, so I'm not going to spend much time there. Uh, wetlands are one of our best edge of field practices. Wetlands are dynamic system, constructed wetlands are dynamic systems of plants, soil, water, and bacteria that all work together to clean nitrogen out of tile drainage water. In addition to this water cleaning benefit, they provide wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, uh, flood retention, so they provide a lot of benefits. The trick with wetlands and sometimes is that they might require land to be taken out of production, and that's sometimes a hard sell for a lot of our producers. The next practice in this slate is alternative open ditch design, which is basically a two-stage ditch. The idea with two-stage ditches is that we're retrofitting traditional trapezoidal uh, drainage ditches to mimic more natural systems. For example, with a two-stage ditch, we have a small main channel in the middle of the ditch, which, con which conveys most of the flow most of the time during the low flow periods. And then we have two small grass benches or small mini floodplains along the sides of this main channel that carry flat flow during higher flow times. And the last practice here in our set of 10 practices is called a saturated buffer. The idea with a saturated buffer is that buffers already provide so many great benefits, but in tile drain landscapes, that tile drain pipe just goes straight through the buffer. And so with a saturated buffer, we're rerouting the drainage water at the edge of the field so that the drainage water actually flows as shallow groundwater through the buffer rather than through the pipe. And in doing so, those great microbes and bacteria that live in the buffer soil and the plants that are living in the buffer can all have access to that nitrogen before that nitrogen seeps out to the stream. 
So we'll go back to bioreactors just because that happens to be one of my favorite practices. And we'll wrap up um, with a couple extra insights on wood chip bioreactors. One of my favorite ways to describe bioreactors is just to look at pictures of bioreactors that have been installed because I think it helps get a handle on what this practice actually looks like. This is a bioreactor we worked on with the Iowa Soybean Association back in 2009. So it's one of the older ones that we have in our slate of research. This bioreactor treated drainage from about 50 acres and was 100 feet long by about 12 feet wide. Here's a bioreactor that we worked on just recently within the past couple months with our partners at the Illinois Farm Bureau. This one had a very small drainage area. Not, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this small of a drainage area. But this bioreactor was 32 feet long by six feet wide. So you can see they tend to be fairly long and narrow. And then this third bioreactor was also put in this last summer here in Illinois. Again, about a 50 acre drainage treatment area, 44 feet long by 11 feet wide. So again, fairly long and narrow, but really just a trench filled with wood chips that you route your tile drainage through. What happens inside the trench is that there's natural denitrifying bacteria that live on the wood chips and use the carbon as their fuel source. What these special denitrifying bacteria can do is as the nitrate in the drainage water floats by them, they convert the nitrate in the water to dinitrogen gas. This is the natural process of denitrification. By adding the extra wood chips, we're simply superpowering or enhancing this process in these little mini water treatment plants. So again, what is a bioreactor? Just a wood chip filled trench. And how does it reduce in-loss and drainage? Well, we're adding additional carbon. We're giving the, these bacteria extra food to superpower them and how much nitrogen they can take out of the water. Keep in mind it's the bacteria that are cleaning the water in these bioreactors. And because it's the bacteria doing the work, it's called a biological process. Because it's a biological process is how we came up with the name of bioreactor. In addition to the trench and the wood chips and the bacteria that are doing the work, there's a couple other parts of the design that are important. First of all, this inflow control structure over on the left of the screen. This structure does two important things um, that make it an important part of the design. First of all, this structure routes water from the field into the bioreactor. And so it diverts water into the bioreactor. Obviously that's an important function. The second thing this control structure does is also allows some water to bypass the bioreactor when, during times when we have a lot of flow coming from the field. It's really a non-starter for most of our farmers to have a practice that's gonna back drainage water up in their field. Drainage systems are expensive and again, an important part of how we do agriculture. And so having this bypass flow as a part of the design is a really important part of the design for times when we have a lot of drainage water leaving the field. Now going to the, the other control structure, which is also an important part of the bioreactor, this is the outflow control structure. Keep in mind this process is a biological process. So these bacteria don't do their job just in the blink of an eye. They need time to process the nitrogen. And so this control structure is responsible for holding water back in the wood chips for long enough time for those bacteria to do their job. We have learned a couple things, a couple good rules of thumb about bioreactors from our research from the past 10 years. Um, and these are a couple of the most common questions we're asked. First and foremost, how well do bioreactors even work? How much nitrogen am I gonna keep from moving downstream? The rule of thumb on this is about 25 to about 45% nitrogen load reduction on an annual basis. And that's, a, that's an average number across all of our research sites. Um, across many years that we've been doing this research. However, keep in mind that's just a rule of thumb. Any given bioreactor in any given year might range from 10% up to almost 100% nitrate removal. So every site is different and every year is always different. The next rule of thumb is, well, how long do these wood chips last before you have to replace them? The rule of thumb there is about 10 years. 
Again, there's error bars on this 10 and on this 10 year rule of thumb, uh, anywhere from really seven years to 15 years. The interesting thing about the design life is that um, what we see is that the bioreactors at the end of their life, at the end of this about 10 years, they don't run out of carbon. They actually uh, reduce, have reduced hydraulic capacity. So that means the wood chips have broken down and it's harder to push water through the wood chips than as we design the system to operate. And so it's not so much that they run out of carbon, it's just that the wood chips have broken down too much and the bioreactor has slumped a lot. That's when you would want to excavate and fill with new chips. And then the last rule of thumb is one of the most important factors for most of our uh, farmers. How much is this going to run me? Rule of thumb, $10,000 to do a bioreactor to treat about 50 acres. And we worked with a farmer earlier this summer who did all of his own excavation. He got free wood chips, which were not necessarily the best wood chips, but he did it for less than $3,000 and he was treating about 50 acres. Um, I've also worked with folks um, out on the East Coast where a private engineering firm was involved in their bioreactor. And it, was, it was upwards of $25,000 to treat 50 or 60 acres. So there's a big range in this cost, depending on, on who you are and what you're interested in. But again, rule of thumb, nice round number, $10,000 to treat 50 acres. So with that, I'll wrap up, but I will just highlight again that this booklet that I mentioned at the beginning, the 10 ways to reduce nitrogen loads from drain cropland in the Midwest. This is already available online. The link is there at the bottom of the screen. You could also Google 10 ways drainage or my name and, and come up with this, or feel free to send me an email if you're interested in what I'm talking about, and I'll put you, I'll put you in the right direction. Thanks again for tuning in.